So imagine you have started a new application, like an awesome voting app where you can vote tabs versus spaces, cloud formation versus Terraform or so. And you create a Docker image and everything works quite nice locally. Now you have to find a way to deploy it to production. And of course you do infrastructure as code, and you start with the cloud formation template. So what resources do you actually need? Yeah, there is, it's an ACS service, um, I need that one and the task definition. So let me copy that for my last project, right? And yeah, then how does it with work with the scaling again? Let's check the AWS docs. Okay, I need some resources um, for CloudWatch, which triggers then some scaling actions. Ah, and I almost forgot the monitoring, right? So which metric should I check again? Maybe the guys from Cloud and I have a good example, so let's look at that and add it as well. Next, I need a load balancer because it needs to be reached from the outside my application. So add that as well. And then also IAM roles, permissions, policies. And at the end for your simple application, your infrastructure contains a couple of hundreds lines of YAML code. Does it sound familiar? So ECS is here just an example. We could do that also with ECR, uh, EC2, RDS, or Lambda-based um, setups. So my name is Philip Gabe. I work at Scout24 as lead platform engineer, um, where I'm a team um, responsible for the whole delivery um, or continuous delivery um, stuff from source, con source code control actually into um, production. And we came up with that topic a while ago where we feel also some pain working with cloud formation that we felt we do always the same things again and again. And that's how we came also in contact with CDK. So I want to give you an introduction to CDK and maybe first, what is infrastructure as code? Maybe raise your hands, who is doing infrastructure as code? Oh, almost all. And who is using cloud formation? Okay, maybe then some of these pain points and limitations that I will tell you are um, maybe familiar to you. I will then also introduce the CDK and then show you how you can, how it helps you to boost your infrastructure. Here I want to quote uh, Keith Morris, who also wrote a book about that, of the definition of infrastructure as code. So he said the enabling idea of infrastructure as code is that the systems and devices which are used to run software can be treated as if they themselves are software. So you have to, if you think about that, that stuff that runs our software should be treated also as software. And if you think about your EC2 instance, for example, a load balancer as a software, it has an API, you can easily create new instances, you can remove them, you can change properties and so on. Why is that so interesting or why is it that important? For me, the first, uh, the most important thing is you can automate things. You don't have to click around uh, in your UI and maybe remember all the things that you did, but you just define what, what you want, um, and that makes it then also repeatable. So you can have multiple stacks from, from the same uh, definition. So you can have your own stack, for example. You can have a stack for, an, for your production account, and so on. So it, the same code, creates also the same infrastructure at the end. And if you have the infrastructure as a code, you can also put it in your favorite version control system. And then you have all the advantages that, that you have, or that you are used with your code as well. Like you can look up the history, you can see a diff, or you can blame others. And here are two different styles how you can do um, infrastructure as code. One is maybe the most common one is the declarative part where, where it's more about the what. So you define what you want. It doesn't, so the entry barrier is quite low. Um, it's most likely some, some text file like a YAML or JSON that you can you know, more or less easily read. Um, but it has also done some, some limitations like you cannot do more advanced constructs like loopings or inheritance and so on. On the other side, the imperative way is, is more about how you achieve that. 
it's normally done by using one of these higher level programming languages where you can also then also use the benefits of these languages, like I said, looping co loops that can easily be used or inheritance. In CloudFormation, when you look at CloudFormation, um, both ways are actually supported at the, at the moment. So we have on the declarative side, you have already your basic YAML or JSON file. You can also make more advanced stuff there already. So you can use include statements, which means you refer to a um, snippet which is somewhere stored in a sweep bucket and include that to your template file. And there's also the SAM transformation, which is an opinionated way to define serverless resources, especially serverless resources, um, where you have to write less, less of these code. And you can also have your own transformation when you look at macros, where you, uh, you can write your own li li uh, logic, and you put then your uh, infrastructure code there, and it will be transformed to a bigger one actually, or more advanced one. From the, on the imperative side, there are already some yeah, tools out there for different languages. For example, for Python, there is Troposphere, Sparkle Formation for Ruby, and Go Formation for, long, uh, for Go. Um, but the interesting point here is all these tools work on the client side. So they generate at the end always a YAML file which is then sent to the CloudFormation API. I think that's the interesting point here. And also the difference to Terraform. So, but what are here the, the problems or limitations of, of CloudFormation? I would put them in these three categories, like time, security, and, and, and trust, and I give you some examples now. Once we have seen in the beginning, it can become very complex. Like for a single job, you have a couple of hundreds of lines of YAML code, and these, like every other code, it needs to be maintained at some point. It can be outdated, or you can have better ways to achieve the same thing. And refactoring here is quite difficult or almost impossible. The next thing that I've seen when working with colleagues or um, talking to other people or other developers is how do we, they use CloudFormation? How, how do they work when they start a new project? And some of them just start with an, from scratch with an empty file. Um, and others use some existing templates and then modify them. At some point, they come to the situation where they copy snippets from, from different places um, and fill it up. So maybe my thing, copy-paste, that's quite smart because it's fast, but actually it isn't So it, because it costs you time. So you, the stuff that you copy f and paste, you have to search for it, you have to review it, and maybe also adapt to your, to your actual needs. And here comes the, the next um, issue as well, because you, the problem comes, where do you copy from? these snippets, where you get that. So it's here not so, bad, so much about malicious code, although that can happen if you think about a Lambda f um, function where you get a zip file from an S3 bucket that's maybe not owned by you, then you don't know what you really execute at the end. But here it's more about where you can um, copy these snippets from. And people have different levels of trust, so they trust maybe the team more than the company and more than uh, the, the internet, but also you never know if the snippet were really complete. Like if you look at CloudWatch alarms, it can be very tricky to make them write, like a small typo or a misconfiguration uh, can lead to the situation that the alarm is never triggered, but you, it's not very obvious when you look at that. And think about if you copied a snippet from another repository. Now you find a critical problem, for example, IAM permissions, which are maybe too open. Then do you apply these changes also in the repo where you copied from, or the other way around? So the repo owner where you copied from made some updates and made some changes, improvements, but how do you know? Also, the owner doesn't know that you copied from him. 
and it's also very hard to align on on best practices with the, especially within a company or a bigger company or a, with different team or multiple teams where you have um yeah it's hard to find a way to um share these these um uh the, the these these findings that you get from production and these tweaks that you just learn um when your software runs in production that you can share that easily with other teams and so on so you can look up for for example in the IM or in the AWS docs but it's more it's more yeah a reference it tells you what you can do but it doesn't tell you what is really a best practice so what is the CDK now CDK is stands for cloud development kit and is one of these imperative approaches to write uh, infrastructure as code. The interesting part here is that it supports already different languages out of the box and on the same level. Like you can write um, or use CDK when you write in JavaScript, TypeScript, Java, .NET, and Python, uh, and more languages are also coming. It's currently in a public beta so you can try it out already and, and work with it. It's also you can also look up the source code. It's on AN on GitHub, um, and you can also contribute or open issues there. They are quite active. How does CDK itself look like? So you have three different objects in, in, in CDK. The first thing is an app, which is the executable program, which is then used to render and deploy your, cl your CloudFormation templates. We'll see that then later in, in detail, but normally you don't have to deal so much with an app. An app can contain one or more stacks, and these are then the deployable units. So a stack in CDK is the same like you know a stack in, in, in your CloudFormation console. And you have some environment information like which account should it be deployed and also which region. And finally, a stack can contain or should contain at least one or can have more than one constructs, which are then the representation of AWS resources. And constructs yeah, can form a hierarchical tree structure. And we see then in, in a second um, how that looks like. When you look at the flow, you have on, on the left side your application, you have your stacks and your constructs, and you get the CDK CLI, which acts kind of as a compiler, and it can synthesize then this, this template. And this template is just a normal cloud formation template with the YAML syntax. But l the longer you work with CDK, it becomes more like an assembly language. Of course, you can look into it, but you don't do that anymore because it's not interesting. You can also deploy it directly to CloudFormation. So when you look at the construct, there are three levels, or the concept of three levels of um, constructs. The level one is the CloudFormation resource one. So this is a one-to-one -one mapping of the existing resources that you already know from CloudFormation. They are also auto-generated based on the AWS resource types reference, and ideally you don't have to deal with these level one constructs at all, because there's also level two. And here it's more on the service level. Uh, for example, ECS, S3, Lambda, and so on, on that level. And they are opinionated, they are handwritten, mostly by, by the CDK team, but also by the community, and they follow the well-architected framework. And level three is then actually what you can do. Your awesome stuff, which acts then often on, on top of them. So you can, for example, create production-ready services. A typical example is, um, if you think about alarms, if you deploy in Lambda, you have often the same alarms that you're interested in. So you can combine these things in one construct and just use that construct again and again. Or, yeah, I had an example which are the 
uh, CloudWatch logs within the Lambda to define also retention time. But in the meantime, this has been done um, by the CDK team. It's no part of these level two constructs. You can also build reusable solutions, like that. Um, some good examples. One is a tweet queue, which is a library or construct library, which allows you to get a feed of Twitter search results and um, based on a keyword, and it puts it in an SQS queue. So the only parameters that you have for these construct is like an API key for Twitter and the hashtag, and that's it. Or for example, you have, can have a table view for DynamoDB um, as, as a construct which builds like a whole mini application where you can see the, the content of your DynamoDB. So you can see that that's there are components and constructs which are on a higher level, which are, then can maybe also can be reused by others. But let's have a look at the code. Let's see if that works. So this is just um, for the demo. So we create a Docker-based application. Like we can have a look here. Um, we have a Docker file, it's a Python application with a very simple um, Hello World example. And we have here our CDK application. So you see here the, the application and stack. And now we add resources to the order constructs to that stack. In that case, it's a VPC. So this is normally, you don't do that because you, not in every application you create your own VPC, um, but just for the demo. And you will see um, that this is already deployed because it takes a while to, uh, yeah, to set up the VPC. Okay, so what we can do here is with the CDK deploy command, we can deploy um, that application directly and what you can also do is you can also you can also look at it how would it how would the cloud formation look like and it creates a very very long uh, cloud formation template just by that single line for the VPC. So what we can do is that we want to have this uh, application. So we, what you no would normally do is you make do a lookup from an existing VPC. You create an ECS cluster. And here we have a load balanced Fargate service. Let's just add the import statements. So we can now do a diff, which tells you already a lot of things that it will change. One is the IAM permissions, security group changes, and here we see the parameters that you have and also all the resources that will be created. We just start the deployment. And then we can go a bit into detail. So here it asks again, I think that's an interesting part, um, because you do critical changes. You change IAM permissions, you change security groups, so you have to confirm that. So and we can see also that, as maybe you noticed, we did not define anything about IAM permissions here. These IAM permissions are automatically generated for you and they follow also the list privilege principle. 
so only the the uh, permissions that are really needed will be will be created of course not everything will work like if you have an a lambda and you access a dynamo database it doesn't know that the lambda code um, needs access to the dynamo table but like here where we said uh, we want to have a local and Fargate service um, we also tell the container image where it should come from and then it knows what needs needs to be done it knows that it needs to be it needs to create the load balancer it needs to create the um, ECS or the Fargate service um, it also automatically creates the ECR repository for our docker image and maybe you have seen that already it compiles our docker image it pushes the changes to the uh, the docker image to the ECR repository and create then the application. So this is also nice, um, nice benefit of the CDK CLI. Uh, like for me, it's a missing feature of the of the AWS CLI that you when you deploy on CloudFormation stack, that you also see the outputs directly in the console, so that you don't have to switch to the to the uh, to the UI. And if we go to a second, should be able to see that. So the update is uh, in progress. You can here also see this all the resources that are created. It's like like a normal CloudFormation stack. So CloudFormation itself doesn't know that it has been created by the CDK. And after a minute or so, can hopefully then also see that it actually works. Are there any questions so far? The API, yes. Exactly. And but this is um, kind of transparent to you. As I said, you can do the synth and you can look at these YAML code, but you will never do that. You're not that. Maybe if you yeah look for problem or so. But in general, just would do a an CDK deploy and, and, and deploy it directly. How do output formats? <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. I, I don't know. I also suppose that they are not very interested in doing that. Um, especially if they have to focus on, on, on as we see maybe also a bit later, um, in making that um, stable enough so that, like that's one one of the one of the issues right now is they do a lot and you still or you have you have frequent releases but also with some breaking changes in there, so that's also why it makes not so much sense to use it right now. In, in in a bigger area, um, not because it's risky, in my opinion, because it's just cloud formations template, um, but more in the sense that you have to, uh, if you update to the latest releases, that you have to apply uh, or to fix all these breaking changes. Yes. I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah, it didn't dig so much into th that topic, but, but maybe you can also solve your um, 
may, maybe you can solve it also differently because you have in a CDK application you can have also multiple stacks um, where you then also define or can say in which accounts they should be deployed or also also in, in multiple regions. And Yeah, I think then becomes more interesting. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe there are some some open issues also on the on 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 the um, repository itself. Okay, finally it's done. Can just prove it. Yes. Yeah. That's, um, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, wasn't planned to to talk about that in in, in detail, but uh, you have the context or the the concept of context. Like you can, let me show you. Which is quite interesting. So, so all the the parameters and there was also an interesting idea behind that. For example, if you use the AMI from an um, think that from an SMS, SSM parameter or so, um, you never know which version you actually or often use. So this is then stored in this context file, which then uh, also allows you to update that context file with the latest version, for example, from of this uh, AMI ID, um, and then um, have that also under version control. And also here you can then provide um, additional parameters. I think we have seen them they are already uh, I think it was with the diff okay now the diff doesn't show anything anymore um, but it, there are already in this stack there are already some parameters I think we can we should have seen that here Which are now filled um, also with some 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 default values, what the values from the, from the context. So it's still supported. Okay, the application is up and running. Um, we can do as well just to see a bit the the possibilities. Here's how you set up auto scaling for your service. Which is which I think is more readable than so if you compare that to the cloud formation uh, code, you can also see the the diff again. And also, if you look at um, alarms, oh, wait a second, too much. Um, for example, failed request count of the of the load balancer. So the 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 constructs itself gives you give you already some some methods back which follows these metric and so on uh, convention. So you can uh, get that as an object, and you see. Um, yeah, on compile time, if that uh, is a correct name for your for your CloudWatch alarms, for example. Okay. So, and how can you boost that? So. What we have yeah, not seen, but what we have with these level two constructs, which you get out of the box already with, with um, um, CDK, is that you have um, yeah, a lot of standard use cases already done, like these load balanced Fargate service, 
or the, the example that I showed uh, before, the log retention for CloudWatch logs for lambdas. Normally, if you create them, uh, they are stored for forever, but here you have the option to de define the, day, the retention days. Also, the asset handling, Docker images is an example, but you can also uh, store some assets on S3 or so. Um, helps you, helps you already a lot. Um, they are, they are looking that all these options, as you can configure basically everything, but um, normally the parameters have a very sane default that can already be used, so you don't have to override so much normally. And like in most, the, yeah, all these IM permissions are also included as, l as long as can detect um, the the relationship between these resources. Like now, we didn't do anything uh, regarding IAM, and it would still work. Here's an um, interesting approach, which has been merged quite recently. This is also on construct, as um, for as yeah, it's the custom resource construct actually. So sometimes you run into the situation that some parts are missing in CloudFormation. CloudFormation doesn't cover that for you. And you have yeah, the chance to write your own custom resource, whatever, and a lot of things uh, to make it possible, or do you have to wait until it will be supported? Uh, but this is a quite nice approach to fix that. And this is the example of um, Fargate, which cannot be triggered by CloudWatch events. So ECS tasks can be triggered, but not Fargate. <coughs> At least not in CloudFormation. If you do set it up by the CLI, it works. And what you do is you adjust on this um, construct, which just internally calls on the AWS CLI, and you just define uh, which actions should be called and which parameters does it get, and that's it. So you can easily add this missing functionality uh, with a couple of lines of code. And where I see then the most benefit is when you share your own level three constructs. This is not yet there, I think, but, but I hope that is coming. Um, because you can build your own constructs and share them as CDK library. And you can use existing technologies, existing package manager, because that's what the CDK team is doing as well. So they provide that as NPM packages for JavaScript, TypeScript, um, or as Maven for Java and so on, or as uh, .NET packages. And you can do that as well. And you can then also, then you can also benefit from that. So you can uh, share that within y your company um, you can find patterns. Where do we do always the same again and again? Or maybe you have to some compliance rules which needs to be fulfilled, like a secured uh, S3 bucket which follows some uh, internal policies and so on. So you can put that these best practices. You can put that in code, not just telling people to write some documentation about that. So we talked here a bit about time, security, and, and trust, and you know then, so here you know where you, who published it, like in any other library. There are also downsides. Uh, I think there were some, some bad uh, problems recently also in the, in the uh, NPM world. But if you, at least you can do that also internally. You set up your own um, package repository and share that internally within your company. And the good thing is you don't have to reinvent the wheel again and again and again, but you can align on these best practices um, within your company, um, just write them as code and share them. And what package methods are good with are updates. So once we have a problem and you have to roll it out, um, you can easily do that with these package managers, and like dependency management becomes more and more um, prominent. Uh, the, I think the recent uh, announcement from GitHub that they, um, I'm not sure if they bought Dependabot, but has an agreement with Dependabot, which sends you pull requests automatically uh, for your dependencies, which needs to be updated, 
um, makes these things quite easy. Compare that to your copy-paste snippets um, from before. So CDK is an imperative approach. You can write that in any of your favorite, or almost uh, your favorite uh, programming languages. Um, I think that's a huge benefit because you are used to that languages anyways. So you don't have to learn anything new. I've seen that it can save you some time. You can easily align on these best practices already with these level two constructs. They are really a big benefit uh, compared to now, but you can also g go on and go away, or go a step further um, and, and write your own um, constructs. And it keeps you secure with these um, already, um, these update mechanisms that are already proven. Yes? Um, yeah, the way how the CDK team um, solves that is they write everything in TypeScript and compiles it in different languages. Like there's another um, project called GC or GSII, which um, can compile these uh, TypeScript code into Java, into .NET, into Python, and, and so on. It's a bit tricky at the moment, so I wrote a blog post about how you can do that by yourself. So, so it's not well documented. You have to find out all these uh, things by yourself. But, but I hope that this will be better than um, once they reach in like in version one. Um, but you can actually do the same. So the tools are already there. Um, and if you want to share that, for example, within your company, and you want to make it available in different languages, then you have. Isn't the downside is that you have to use TypeScript in that case? But you can do that. It's just a compile step and, and a publishing step uh, into these uh, different package repositories. Yeah, what I said already, it's, it's still beta. There are breaking changes, and not all these, um, a, not every AWS service is covered by these level two constructs. Um, as there are often also a lot of discussions um, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, and so on. But I think the, especially in the um, container and, and serverless area, a lot of things are already covered. What's not that clear yet is the migration path. So if you have a CloudFormation stack, which you maybe cannot change easily because you have some state there, I think then it becomes um, interesting because uh, what, what CDK does is it changes the logical uh, resource names as well. So they have the the ones that you def so you define also name still, um, but it gets a hash at the end in, in addition. And um, you can fix that with the mapping, but it's it's yeah, it's not not that clear and also not well documented how you can migrate existing CloudFormation templates there. Also. Yeah, existing limits still uh, apply, like these 200 resource limits per stack, which becomes not that obvious anymore. So like if you have this YAML file at some point, um, you will maybe notice that there are a lot of um, resources in that file. Um, but here with some, maybe some loops or so, it's not that obvious anymore. And I've just said uh, with the language support, if you want to write for different languages, you have to use um, TypeScript. Not sure if that changed, maybe, but the moment it is like that. Yeah, and there are some more the interesting part here is also unit testing. Um, all these constructs are very well tested and often when I looked up something which I didn't understand how to use it, I looked into the tests and that makes it easy and, and you see how it should be used. Um, they have also some frameworks where it's really easy to write tests for your own construct, especially if you want to share them um, it makes sense to define or just to um, yeah, put your intention why you did things like you did um, in your in your tasks and verify that. 
was it the asset handling? We didn't go into detail with also with the context, and also it would be a completely uh, separate task uh, talk to um, to see how you can do that um, and deploy that in multiple languages. But if you want to get your hands dirty, um, I can recommend the cdkworkshop.com page, uh, which is quite nice. You can do that step by step, and it explains all the things what is happening there. And yeah, apart from that, if you're interested also in further AWS topics, um, I'm also yeah part of the community day which we are preparing um, for 9th of September in in Hamburg. So um, yeah, we'll hopefully hear about that um, in more details what was what is planned, but save the date already. So are there any other questions? Yes? Another good question. Um, and nested stacks in that case is, is not, I haven't seen that in CDK itself, but, but you can define multiple stacks uh, inside your CDK application. As a, it, it, they will not show up as nested stacks, but as, as separate stacks. Okay, thank you.